Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce the panel. I'm just spotting to see if our fifth panel member is anywhere close. He's stuck in traffic. I'll, I'll impersonate him after I introduce myself. If Fine, afterwards. you do the impersonation part. Okay. okay, I'll take this seat then. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the DevNet Zone. Have you all been enjoying the show so far? Everybody having fun? Right, isn't the DevNet Zone cool? Yes. Come on, bit of energy here. Yes, thank you. <laughs> what we're going to have today is an open discussion about the network infrastructure space. This includes controllers, orchestration, and device level APIs. And what we've gathered here today is me not being able to use this pointer properly. Okay. <laughs> Tell you what, I need to go back to my laptop and find out why I can't use a pointer properly. I think they should have like a screen there for... Uh... Okay, good. Right. Sorry about that. See what's going on. <laughs> Two main things. Introductions, which we'll keep very brief, and then questions and answers. And it is a panel session. We are here to help you understand what our strategy is, and we've gathered the experts we have here today because they represent the collective wisdom across this space within Cisco. So, on to introductions. Christine? Oh, okay, so I'll, I'll go first. I'm Christine Bacon. I'm a Senior Director of Product Management in the Enterprise Networking Group. So I'm responsible for SDN in the enterprise space as well as our core software platform technologies across our operating systems, um, which are obviously running on our switches and the, and the routers. Next would be Carl, but it's not, so I'll go straight on to Giles. So my name's Giles Heron. I'm part of the CTO group within Cisco. Uh, I guess my focus lately, the last year or two, has been largely on the Open Daylight Controller um, and on the Cisco Open SDN Controller, which is our commercial distribution of it. Uh, also very much involved in NetConf Yang from a sort of modeling perspective, uh, one of the Yang doctors at the ITF. So if you have Yang questions, feel free to come and ask. Thank you very much. Mike? Yeah, so my name is Mike Cohen. I'm a director of product management in the NCMA business unit. So I joined Cisco through its NCMA acquisition. Um, you know, as part of our group, I've been focused on everything we've done in the open source community. Um, part of that has been driving policy and some of the policy concepts we developed with ACI into open source and helping them actually pervade some of the controller strategy at Cisco. Um, but also a lot of work um, involved with just general programmability on the ACI platform and on our Nexus platform coming out of INSPU as well. Great, thanks very much, Phil. So I'm Phil Cassini, I'm currently Director of Product Management for the APIC EM product. Prior to that, I was the product lead for the XNC product, most of which was donated to ODL. And then prior to that, I was the, on the original cross-functional team that set the initial SDN strategy for the company. Thank you very much. Those are the introductions. You can see that we have the right people here. Now on to the questions. I'm just going to use this diagram to explain some of the context around the discussion we're going to be having today, which stems from controllers, from orchestration through controllers, and down to the device level APIs. And what we want to be able to do today is help you understand our strategy in this space. And I'll start off with Christine. Christine, could you go over the main elements of our strategy across orchestration, controllers, and device level APIs? Yeah, I mean, I would say our Cisco strategy is to be a um, comprehensive provider of SDN across our network domains, starting from the data center to the campus branch networks and to the WAN domain as well. Uh, our portfolio consists of our SDN controllers that are domain-specific controllers, such as the APIC controller in the data center, APIC EM in the enterprise campus branch networks, uh, as well as on the uh, service provider WAN side, we have a variety of uh, different uh, orchestration as well as controller architectures for um, you know, the custom customization needs of the service provider domain. Uh, so what we're really focusing on is providing really you know, comprehensive solutions for our customers that are needing controller-based automation or device-level programmability across these different sectors. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, Carl, who uh, will be joining us shortly, could also talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in terms of cross-domain orchestration with NSO, which is an acquisition we made with TailF recently. 
Yeah, so you know, I can add a little bit to what Christine was Please saying. Do. You know, and especially in, if you think about things, um, you know, and why we took on this sort of domain-specific controller approach. That we looked at things like the data center, and we actually found that there's a lot of specific requirements. You know, managing data center fabrics. Um, that you know, ways in which it overlapped, and ways in which it was very different than, say, an enterprise environment. So we basically came up with a strategy where we build domain-specific controllers. But what we wanted to do was define a unified policy model and you know, effectively allow these controllers to all be programmed in the same way and have the same language be used to interface with them and then clearly define the interaction points between them but not have them be exactly the same because the domains actually had a lot of you know, specific characteristics that lent themselves to different products. So Phil, do you want to maybe mention APKM, just kind of how we're providing a differentiated controller strategy for the campus branch networks and how that contrasts from APIC? I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, no, the yeah. audio up here is very challenging. Yeah, right. no, just, uh, just in terms of APIC-EM and how that provides uh, domain-specific capabilities for the campus brand. Yeah, so when you think about a LAN, the purpose of a LAN is to what, connect users to applications typically sitting in a data center. And so we found a need to have a user policy-based controller that sits in the enterprise that facilitates a lot of that. So in the tradition of controllers, we have northbound APIs that we publish to allow people to write applications to do things like collect information, uh, about the network devices under management, the identity and location of, of, of users that are signed on to the network, and maybe some of the application flow data uh, that's uh, being accessed through the LAN network. Uh, we're extending that capability now also to the wide area network and building applications to do uh, some day zero, day one provisioning uh, at the edge to try and uh, b push some OPEX out of the, uh, of the WAN control uh, area. And so the APKM sort of straddles both the LAN and WAN, um, and then we also implement the single policy model to uh, ensure that we're uh, in synchronization with all the cross-domain initiatives in the company. Yeah, and Carl, who just joined us here up front, um, I'm going to put you on the spot. So Carl is our technical director uh, responsible for our uh, NSO product, um, and that provides cross-domain orchestration across the domains. And it's one of our key components in terms of our SDN strategy. So maybe Carl could give us a little bit of an overview as to how that plays into the overall space that we're in. Absolutely. Thank you, Christine. Yeah. And I thought San Jose traffic was bad. Guys, there's something we need to fix here. So without having the background, exactly what you guys said, yes, of course, um, the TDF acquisition, uh, I, heard you, I heard you mention going on the stage here, uh, provides that layer that goes across the domains. And we really have a, a product or an offering that actually doesn't really dip into, if you like, the particulars of the verticals, but actually provides a, if you like, a model-specific or a model-driven way of doing things. And it's up to the domain specifics to express uh, the needs of, of that. Um, uh, perhaps the one thing to point out is that we believe that in terms of the, see we have this uh, presentation here, the RFS layer, we believe that a model-driven approach gives you the flexibility needed to actually express the needs for many different things and stay out of, if you like, the uh, process-driven approach. So I guess that, that's kind of the core of what we're bringing to the RFS layer uh, style orchestration. And it's probably worth talking uh, you know, about that model-driven approach and how by sort of happy coincidence, uh, both the TLF acquisition and the product we now brand as NSO and Open Daylight and the Cisco Open SEN controller, they're both based around the same modeling language, which is Yang. Uh, and so it's very natural for one to express requirements to the other. And I guess as you know, Phil was talking about day zero, day one configuration in APKM, and I guess what we see in, in the service provider space is that the, the NSO product pretty much drives that. And you can see in the diagram, sorry, pointing that way, the kind of white box because it's, it's part of the orchestrator platform, but it also takes over that day zero, day one configuration role. And so you then ask, well, you know, how does that relate to what we do with Open Daylight? Well, the answer is that's very much the configuration piece, whereas Open Daylight's more on topology discovery, uh, more dynamic programming with things like PCEF or OpenFlow. So it's quite a natural kind of division of labor, one might say, between those two roles. But both of those sitting under the NSO orchestration layer so that we can both configure uh, persistent config on, on routers and other devices, but also do that more ephemeral configuration, uh, things like PCEF and OpenFlow. 
Thank you very much. One of the key areas that we want to be able to understand in more detail is how we see not only our orchestration and controller level API strategy evolving, but what impact that's also going to have in what we're doing at the device layer. Because what we'd like to see from our platforms is a consistent model-based API strategy across all elements. Could you speak to that, please? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's very clear. You know, you've, you've probably got my entirely unbiased opinion thus far, which is that Yang is the way forward. And I think what we're seeing uh, across the industry as a whole, this isn't a, a Cisco thing, is people looking to get Yang data models onto devices um, so that those devices can be easily configured um, by systems so that instead of being in a traditional SP world where we, we wrote expect scripts to talk to a CLI, we now have a clear API layer that's mo expressed in models. So for example, one of the huge benefits you get from that is that uh, you know, traditionally we always had this EMS lag of you know, six months often, maybe three, maybe nine, but this lag where a new feature would come on the device and it would take us several months to get that into management layer. And now with these model-driven platforms like Open Daylight and like um, NSO, as soon as those capabilities are there, they can be expressed to the management layer. And that's just a really powerful concept. I think another thing briefly worth saying is that we do have a, a transition strategy, and that's really around the, the capability of NSO to also do effectively a translation from NetConf Yang into CLI. So to bridge you from the world today where devices don't yet have it to a future world where they will have it. But certainly our, our goal, if we look long term, would be for the industry to, to have standardized models for device configuration, standardized models also for device management, expressed through those Yang models so that we can manage things across, domain, across vendors and across domains very simply. Thanks very much. We've seen a lot of Yang in the service provider space because it's been driven by discussions in that area. But what are we seeing? What are customers talking about in the enterprise and data center as well? Are we going to see the same concepts arriving there? I'll take that one for the enterprise. Um, yeah, I think eventually we get there. It may be a little slower pace because, um, you know, in the enterprise, you have, uh, it's a little different than in the service provider space or even in the data center where you have a lot of heterogeneous equipment. You have a lot of versions of iOS and it's spread out. So you have a logistics problem. And so the approach that we're taking to, uh, asking you to, to walk across the bridge to the SDN world is one of uh, starting with what you have now and evolving into it at your t own time and own pace. So today, the APKM, for example, uses a CLI interface so that you don't even have to touch a box. You literally put the VM on a server, it, you give it an IP address range, and it goes and discovers stuff. It does that in the same manner as if you were logging into the box using an SSH or a Telnet session. So, the controller, the way it's built, though, is modular so that the thing that Giles was talking about um, can be integrated in the future. Um, and we're only beginning to see now, I think, some interest in NetConf. But the reason I think that it will come once it starts is because if you look at the use cases in the service provider and the data center space, they tend to be fairly more complex than where the market is at or where the customers are at in terms of adopting enterprise use cases. So you can use CLI, it's okay. But that is going to break down as an interface methodology once you start to get larger and more complex transactions. And so you do need to be able to be more intelligent about how you communicate between the box and the controller. And so again, for the next 18 months, so maybe several years, for the salient use cases that start you on the SDN roadmap, uh, they'll be fine. You don't have to touch a box. But there'll come a day where you'll have to do an iOS upgrade, or you'll have to do an operating system upgrade, or maybe even a box upgrade. Um, and things like NetConf and even Yang will become uh, important because the use case complexity will be driving uh, the need for that, uh, that more intelligent, sort of efficient communications. Yeah, and I can relate, so let me relate that into what we're doing in our BU as well with, you know, with ACI we actually took, you know, an interesting approach and, you know, we had effectively the realization that, um, you know, data center environment is also really complex and ultimately our in constituent was a software developer who wanted to launch, you know, an application, um, you know, to serve some, some line of business. 
and to do that, we effectively took the, the path of basically developing what we call like abstract models. Um, you know, in ACI Ireland, we call this an application-centric model. To you know, basically designed around describing what an application looks like, and you know, then allowing that model to be changed from an abstract form into a concrete form locally on on different devices. So in the ACI world, world um, you know, these you know, essentially you know, a, you know these abstract policies are then rendered locally on, on on different devices, and we're doing that on our physical switches, and we're doing that in our virtual switches, and that gives us a very scalable way of just kind of distributing these policies across fabrics. Um, now, again, you know, where does that collide with the world that's going on with, say, Netcoff and Yang? You know, we're, we're certainly seeing that begin to get there you know, in the data center as well. You know, one of the main areas you know, I, you know, I think it's taking the most concrete form is around service configuration. So when you look at things like layer four through seven services, you know, you know th that fits into our application-centric view of the world very, very cleanly, but actually how those devices get configured can be very specific per vendor. So things like Yang can actually be really, really helpful of you know, bringing all those devices into the fold and allowing them to fit together. Um, you know, that'll obviously get broader and it'll pervade, obviously, the entire architecture over time. But services is really where you know, I see it hitting the data center very directly right now. Yeah, I would say just uh, in terms of the Yang model evolution, we saw that really start on the service provider space, and I would say a lot of the innovation often starts in these spaces, such as the service provider space, where they have high scale, high velocity, high frequency, uh, kind of you know configuration change requirements for their business. So we saw a lot of the Yang traction happen in the service provider space, and 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 actually Carl could speak to it quite quite a bit because he's one of the Yang uh, masters uh, in in this space. Um, but what we're also looking at is that, you know, really the, the, the needs uh, that even the service providers had in terms of high frequency rate of change, you know, being able to go ahead and uh, crank out these services as quickly as possible. That's not a service provider unique requirement. It's something that we're seeing in these, you know, massively scalable data centers, a lot of the service provider like enterprises, whether they're large financials, et cetera. So we're seeing a lot of those requirements also transform translate into the enterprise space. So what we're looking to do from a Cisco strategy perspective is really provide model-driven interfaces across all of our devices, all of our switches. Our entire switching and routing portfolio will be providing model-driven interfaces based on Yang definitions. Uh, and that will essentially be able to integrate seamlessly with our portfolio of cross-domain you know, cross orchestration products such as NSO, as well as our various different controller products. Uh, as we provide uh, you know, Yang-based interfaces that are either NetConf-based or REST-based from the device, we'll be able to really uh, fulfill the needs of all of our uh, SDN controllers, as well as our orchestration system, as, as well as app developers that are building applications and tools, such as you know, uh, configuration automation tools, such as Puppet Labs. Um, we were able to go ahead and support all of those requirements by providing model-driven interfaces from our devices. And, and Carl, do you want to talk a little bit about Yang? Absolutely, yeah. and it, it's, to your point, it was a, it's been a couple of interesting years, right? It was a, a piece of networking, a field of networking, if you like, that was underserved for a while, and it was really a left-right uh, between SDN and uh, literally an NFV that really kicked people into gear in order to solve a fundamental issue, a fundamental shortcoming we had. Right? SDN really snapped people into thinking, what can software do to my network, right? Above and beyond, of course, particular protocols like OpenFlow, like all the protocols that we had. And NFV really yeah. proved nobody, that nobody unless we actually have a okay. Okay. Hang on, I'm not sure the mic's working. No? It, it's almost like I'm hearing myself too much. <laughs> Like that? Is that better? Like that? Speak up? That is usually not the problem I have. <laughs> okay. I'll speak up more. Like that? Oh, that's okay. working, yeah. Here we go. Thank you. So, so the left was SDN, snapping people into thinking, what can software actually do to me, seriously? What can, what can this do to my network? And NFV really proved that unless we have a programmatic approach or an automatic approach, we're not going to be able to go there because networks suddenly became so ephemeral so if you like light, that if you actually had the, the, even the idea that there's humans involved, it's, it's, an, it's a no-go, right? In order to actually even start thinking about that, of course, you need a declarative way of explaining to software what you can do, right? 
So Yang really slotted into that. And again, Yang was not the first time <laughs> we tried. It's probably not the last time we tried, but it was a very timely um, uh, way of thinking about things that really slotted into a serious and fundamental, almost to the computer science level, problem that we had, right? And it's not perfect, right? And again, it's not going to be the last one, but it just was very timely and it fits the needs of people's uh, current issues. So um, we're, we're, as you guys now know, we're pretty aggressive about it. And we really think that, you know, barring any uh, you know, new contenders that young people may come up with, you know, this is actually what, we're, we, what we have to work with. And uh, the, 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 uh, almost the aggressive uh, energy going into Yang right now is, is, is pretty crazy. One of the things that we do, or I do actually, is that I spend my time trying to herd the um, excitement around Yang in uh, environments like the ITF and the MEF. And I think going into the most recent ITF meeting, we had 190 models coming from a wide variety of contributors. So it's not a, a problem of whether Yang is the language or no, it's more how can we rapidly make this useful uh, to the industry, yeah. of course. And and I, would, we have, yeah. and I would just add, you know, these models that are being defined in these standards bodies that Carl actively participates in, there are a lot of these requirements and the model definitions are coming from customers themselves, not just from the vendors. So it's something that we're getting real-time feedback from customers that are actually using these models. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and actually, the variety of sources of these models are, is staggering. Otherwise, the traditional ITF way is that vendors come up with things and try to push it right. through. Oh, I'd, like, have a lot, um, of I'd right. like us to get into this a bit more, but I also would like to encourage your audience to ask questions of the panel. It's not often we get these experts together in a position to answer your questions. So I'm going to resort to bribery here. Everybody okay with bribery? Anybody doesn't want to be bribed? Okay. This is a water bottle. It's a very cool water bottle. And it goes to the first person who asked a question from the audience. Sir, I'll come down there so I can hear your question. Hang on. I'm going to have to repeat it because the audio here is challenging. All right, you got a mic? Brilliant. I can give you the water bottle anyway. Then give him the mic. Thank you. I wanted to ask the strategy around micro segmentation. Uh, what what is the strategy around micro segmentation? So I, I can certainly speak to what we're doing with micro segmentation in the data you know in, in the data center world. Right. Yeah, there's obviously you, know, you mentioned when the domain specific controllers you know that we're taking will we'll ultimately take potentially different approaches to how to how you think about this. Uh, but you know it, I can certainly talk about what we're doing in APIC um, you know in the data center world because we announced micro segmentation you know, at Cisco Live and we'll be and we're we are supporting it now th through our platform. Um, and basically you know it has you know there, there's two critical components um, you know that, that we announced as part of that um, you know that leverage our, our application virtual switch. You know, one of them is to be able to impose a stateful firewall, essentially that can run in the hypervisor as part of you know, as part of the virtual switch. Um, you know, that can then you know, you know, have everything be driven by a global policy model, but also be able to enforce stateful services down in the hypervisor. Um, you know, the other thing that we found a lot of people asking for was what we called attribute-based um, you know, attrib attribute-based identification or attribute-based policies. So if you think about ACI, everything is driven off this application-centric model. The critical component of that is what we call an endpoint group. An endpoint group defines you know, essentially your connectivity and security policies. The group you land in is treated a certain way, and everything in it essentially has that you know, a particular set of connectivity security associated with it. So what we can do with micro-segmentation is actually extract attributes from the underlying system. So this might be going to VMware and sucking out um, OS type and you know, different vCenter characteristics. It might mean going to OpenStack and sucking out uh, things like you know, information out of Nova or labels that are provided by the user. Um, you know, it might be going to some other kind of you know, orchestration system and sucking out you know, tag data that the, the user provided. Then we can use that information to actually uh, you know, you essentially segment different properties and, and, you know, and cut up and define what policy you have applied to you. So essentially what group you are a member of is actually a product of um, you know, a user-defined behavior as well as many characteristics of, of a VM or of a server. So this allows you to say add a number of labels to a particular workload and that combination of labels defines what policy it gets. 
also, uh, I mean, is that integrated with like Palo Alto or other vendors where like uh, for, can we use their uh, the firewall for micro segmentation? And so, from micro segmentation standpoint, uh, you know. You know, know what we can. You know, not not right now. You know, we so we have an embedded firewall that we ship with AVS. Um, you know, that that runs inside the hypervisor. We do have an integration with ACI. Obviously, you know, you know, we're, we're working on one in conjunction with Palo Alto using our device package API. So device packages actually allow you to, um, you know, insert layer four through seven devices into chains of network services that we would then dynamically stitch as part of ACI. One of the devices you can use in that capacity is Palo Alto, so we are working with them very closely. And that'll tighten, that'll tighten over time, but right now we allow you to essentially use the device package to configure the Palo Alto and stitch it inside a service chain. Uh, thanks, uh, there's a related question, I mean. Uh, you definitely earned your water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, uh, so there is like service chaining is currently done by device package, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then there is also group-based policy and open daylight service chaining model. So uh, going forward, which model uh, would Cisco be promoting more, or so, what is the future? So, uh, so I'll give a nuanced answer to, to your question. You, I'll argue that the model is actually the same. We haven't changed the model. Group-based policy was derived from uh, you know a lot of the in initial concepts of APIC, um, and then it took form in open daylight. It's, you know, there's a form that's developed in OpenStack. Um, you know, the, you know, at a high level, the user-facing model is actually the same in terms of you know, what it looks like to ask for and request, you know, request services. Um, now, the question, you know, there's a question of well, you know, in ACI, um, you know, you know, how, how will that interact? So, particularly in the OpenStack case, to be concrete, if you're using OpenStack group-based policy you know, with, a, with ACI, you know, our initial support for group-based policy will not use device packages. We'll actually manually create different endpoint groups and stitch services directly via the via OpenStack orchestration. And then, but we have a framework actually built into the open source to allow vendor-specific drivers. Device packages will be one of those over time, and we'll actually be leveraging the direct API capability there as well. Thanks a lot. Over there on the question over there. Can you see that gentleman? We'll do this one first. Do we? And, and bribery if you want the t-shirt. Sure, okay. Well let's uh, someone try his hand up first. <laughs> so uh, oh, I've got a question there, beg your pardon. Just on the on the enterprise side um, what's the roadmap for extending APIs to like the remainder of your iOS XE platforms and maybe ASAs? Um, and then how are you guys thinking about tools like Chef and Ansible? Oh, yeah. So I could take that. Uh, I couldn't hear all the questions, but um, so in terms of our API coverage across the platforms, we have actually a session right after this where we'll, we'll actually talk about the roadmap a bit. Uh, right now, we have really a um, limited number of APIs that are NetConf REST-driven APIs. Some of those are available on our CSR platform as well as our XR-based platforms. November of this year, we will be providing GA production quality APIs on our XE-based platforms, our iOS XE-based platforms that are the catalyst the ISR, ASR platforms. So those will all be providing consistent APIs that could essentially be used for automation, configuration, operational procedures on the device, for essentially you know, enabling automation of, of, of device management. Um, we have integration with Puppet Chef today on our Nexus platform because a lot of the DevOps tooling uh, is currently used in the data center primarily, and we wanted to make sure that we had good coverage in terms of providing that end-to-end -end server to network automation through those DevOps tool chains. So we um, provide that with um, Puppet Labs on our, on our data center um, platforms. We are expanding that coverage to the Nexus 5K and the 7K this year as well. So that you know provides coverage across 3K, 5K, 7K, and the 9K in the Nexus side. Uh, we will be also expanding tooling support um, in terms of Chef uh, as well as Ansible. Ansible is an agentless architecture. It's actually getting a lot of momentum, gaining a lot of momentum in the um, in the customer space. So we want to be able to go ahead and provide tooling integration to those APIs that we're providing across all of our platforms, whether it's data center 
campus uh, access network devices as well as on the service provider side. On the DevOps one, there's also a session tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock sadly, on DevOps and networking. And you'll find over here in the DevNet zone a DevOps pod where our various partners are also describing what they're doing. And in the world of solutions, you can also go and find Puppet too. And actually, look, you know, going back a little bit with the intent of Yang was to have a declarative way of describing the syntax, semantics, and operations of an API. You see some resemblances here, right? So the idea here is that Yang semantically provides a superset of what we believe programmers need, right? So you will see things like Yang to Swagger, Yang to IO Docs, Yang to you know, different types of recipes, because the semantic richness is enough that we can actually translate into various different domains. To Christine's point, it's a matter of tooling. You know, I think we have the, again, we have the computer science right. Now it's a matter of tooling. Brilliant. Yeah, I have a question concerning uh, Epic EM, because our network's enterprise, uh, what, to that. We, uh, currently, we have a lot of uh, in-house, for example, dynamic QS. We allow dynamic uh, marking of the SCP for different data flow. And we also um, have a dynamic shaping. Basically, it depends on the bandwidth uh, allocation. We will shape that dynamically. So all this we do in-house in our own way. So when I noticed that, hey, we have an uh, Epic EM available, so we are very excited to see if we can uh, implement those kind of dynamic uh, using the uh, Epic EM way of doing that. Then I realized most of our network devices, for example, is 3800 uh, series, 3800 series, which is currently not supported. Uh, I've, Epic EM do not support the, uh, I think, ISL 3800. So I wanted to know is that what's your plan in, in, in terms of uh, when the uh, 3800 will actually support your Epic EM? If it's not, um, you say, what's the way for us? For example, can we? Using the existing daylight, open daylight, and have our own plugin to communicate with our current existing mechanism to, you know, to do dynamic QS and all this stuff. So a lot of questions in that one question. <laughs> Let me see if I can peel it apart. So first of all, um, the state of the release of APIC EM right now was using data models that we sort of built homegrown through our beta process. What we've done as a strategy is moved away from that, and in the, in the next release, you will have uh, the data element structures, which are more common to uh, the products that we've had in the market before that do network element management, such as Prime. And so what we get as a benefit of that is we pick up basically the entire portfolio of Cisco in the next release. So the specific question about the 3800 is in the next release, that and just about the entire portfolio will be su supported. To your question about sockets and plugins, part of this infrastructure that we have um, also accommodates a sort of socket mentality that you can develop device in a sort of a device driver type way. And as I said before, that will start with a sort of device pack spec kind of uh, approach, but we expect to evolve that relatively quickly into something like a NetConf approach so that that interface will be more clear. And to Carl's point, um, I, we expect a lot of the partner and customer and uh, vendor communities to be able to provide these kinds of device drivers. So we're going to provide the nuts and bolts to do that. Um, and then it's a relatively straightforward process to actually uh, put something in that in place. That will likely uh, be more prevalent early on in the, our multi-vendor third-party support strategy, right? So that you know, one of n number of entities can connect a third-party support box to our controller. So short answer is, next release, you'll have what you want specifically, and um, a much broader portfolio 
of of of, uh, of support. Very good. So, more questions from the audience, and I would add gentleman the teacher. Yeah. Uh, my uh, question is regarding the, the API. For example, APKM provides a very nice way to, let's say, normalize the APIs for the enterprise products. Now, if, if we translate, or if we go into data center, NX API, APC API are completely different, and there's no, actually, there's no an easy way, let's say, in the API. DC to, to, to have a clean API like, like you have in APDM. Yes, we have a RESTful interface there, uh, but you need 100 lines of code probably to do something useful when you're not using the API toolkit. Uh, so is there any plan to consolidate and, and bring in a, a nice API normalization for the data center as well? So there's definitely an effort going on with the APIC DC and APIC EM team to normalize on a policy model, right? And that policy model will essentially be, uh, you know, if not identical, at least uniform across the platforms uh, to allow, the, again, the domain controllers to, to, to interact. Um, so there's absolutely a plan, a plan to do that. And there's some work going on the APIC DC side. There's a lot of work going on on the APIC EM side to, to, to align on those things on the model front. Um, that'll only partially address your your question, which was kind of you know kind of a clean API, and I guess it's it's not as clear to me um, exactly what the, the the pain point is there. Um, you know, in the you know with a, essentially what we tried to expose with APDC was a REST-based interface that was fully you know you know. You know, fully object-based. So everything in APIC is modeled as an object. You have a REST-based interface to you know, to to control those objects. Um, you know, you know, one of the issues people do have as they delve into it is there are a lot of things, and configuring anything takes a lot of different steps. So the way we're approaching that are the tools you mentioned, the ACI toolkit. There's also a Python SDK. I've got a session tomorrow. I'm showing both of these things. Um, you know, where you can use higher-level languages to modify, you know, modify this, and they may make mo multiple REST calls behind the scenes. Um, you know, we're not going to change the underlying object model for APIC because it does give you maximum flexibility. And we did it that way because, like our GUI, we built using that API. So we needed to do all. The, you know, we needed control of all this stuff. We thought someone else might as well. So we'll end up having layers that hide some of it from you, but we, we want to be able to let you get behind it if you want. Yeah, just to add to that, so what we are providing is basically a normalized policy interface layer across our domain controllers. So that will be based on our group policy model that Mike mentioned. Mike works very heavily on this. Is in the, in the open source community, uh, we're working very heavily to make sure that there's good understanding of what policy model should look like to make it declarative, not make it look so network centric, make it application friendly as well as user friendly about being able to understand user groups and resources on the data center network, being able to create policies that really are comprehensive policies across the domains. So that's what really group based policy work is really about in the open source. Uh, and we will be using that model as a way to normalize our policy model across enterprise campus networks, which are user-centric networks, to the data center, re data center networks that are resource-centric resource networks. So that's our policy model normalization strategy. Now, in terms of those other APIs on the controller, it could be about you know, inventory uh, level information about the network, uh, or topology APIs, or about just you know, capabilities on the device. So, um, what you know, we have obviously APIs today. They're not going to always be perfect. We're not always uh, going to provide maybe the most user-friendly API. Some you know efforts have been better. I think APIC EM APIs have been definitely much more user-friendly. Um, but we're open to feedback also, and uh, we'll continue to evolve the APIs. And we're very committed to making sure that our APIs are as usable as possible. And any feedback that you guys provide after you guys take a look at them uh, are very welcome. Can I just say, as a software person, the fact that we have a conversation about you know, what's the correct way of normalizing data sets for your consumption at a networking event, to me, is a huge step forward. You know, in general, the fact that we have moved the conversation into not the fact that there's an API, but you actually have strong opinions about the way we structure the data set that you can reach to the API is, 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 is huge to me. It's just, just a big, big, big step forward.
So I like, I like having this conversation. Yeah, I mean, I would say even our device APIs, we realized that, hey, you know, we weren't necessarily providing the most user-friendly uh, sort of tools in terms of how to leverage the device APIs, and we're evolving it. We're not saying we knew, uh, you know, the, the best way to do it from day one. We're evolving it. We're realizing that we need to be model-driven, so that's definitely a commitment that we've made. We're pushing hard to provide model-driven interfaces across all of our platforms. We're learning as we go and we're also trying to be very responsive and um, you know listening um, to to the community and to our customers and I, I think that's one thing that we realize that we haven't done very well in the past and that we have to learn uh, and, and evolve as we move forward next question my question is that like it seems there are a lot of pieces and puzzles you guys try to accomplish for this SDN strategy what are your plans for the next? What are you trying to accomplish in the next three months? In the next year, next three year, and next five year? Because if I don't see, if I don't hear the deadline, it's just a dream for you. you. You're selling me your dream, not a product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, representing the higher level of the stack, let me start from the top. Yeah, yeah. Right? And the fact is, of course, you know. In general, the message that we have is to give back the control of the future actually to our customers. So all the talk we're having about models, APIs, and all that stuff is actually a subtle way of passing that question back to you, to be very frank, right? We're stepping out of ramming solutions into people's problem spaces, stepping back and asking, actually, why don't you tell me? What is it that you want to do? I mean, you, you, you will hear, if you haven't, Cisco talk a lot about business outcomes. What is the business outcome you're looking for? And let us tell you how we apply the stack that we have to best practices around it, right? So it's, it's actually a, a lovely question because it, it's, a, it's a way for us to actually almost play it back to you. Why don't you tell us? And we will tell you how we would suggest applying the moving parts here to your problem space. So that's the, I, the vague top level question I'll yeah. pass it down. No, and I, I, maybe I'll, uh, so in my domain, I think I can be very specific about what we're delivering when, right? For the data center, we have a very, you know, we have a very concrete strategy. There's a product shipping today in APIC um, that you can use, you know, your, your ACI solution that gives you an integrated overlay and underlay, which is what we found really is the holistic solution for the data center to give people max, you know, multi-tenancy you know, across a, ma a managed fabric. Um, you know, and that, that's available right now, so two-month strategy, obviously there's a re another release coming out. Um, you know, but you'll, 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 you'll see that solution evolve, you'll see that solution scale. Um, you know, you know, you know, we'll, you'll see a broader ecosystem develop around it. So we have, a, you know, we have a very concrete strategy in the data center that I think it, you know, actually is serving our customers really well and, and growing pretty well. Um, and you can also, you know, if you listen to some of our announcements today, you know, we're augmenting that with solutions you know, that can run without ACI also on our switches. Things like BGP, EVPN, um, where you can actually start dissecting some of these pieces. If you don't want ACI, um, you can actually now build VXLAN fabrics out of our switches and use them as a building block of a data center SDN solution. Um, you know, combine them with, um, you know, with, with overlays or combine, you know, combine them with, with other controllers and manage them that way as well. So we're trying to give you both the choice of having the, the different pieces and options as well as the holistic ACI solution. And, and we're shipping these things right now. Yeah, I could probably give, give a sort of overview from, a, say, the open daylight perspective and from the device perspective. Um, so to go for daylight, well, it's an, open, it's an open source project managed by the Linux Foundation. So what happens there is very much driven by that, and the focus short term is the next release. And then from a Cisco perspective, it's going to be getting that release into Cisco's version of the controller. Um, and I think with that, because it's an open source project, again, back to Carl's point about reflecting it back, it's really about what people want to contribute, and that, that drives where it goes. Uh, from our side, certainly, we're focusing on the usual stuff of stability, you know, particularly the clustering support, making sure that in terms of scaling and performance, because step one is get the thing out there, step two is make it really perform. Um, so we're doing a lot of work on things like, you know, make, making the open flow and the BGP support scale. Um, to devices, I guess I would see the sort of short term is get APIs out there. You know, in the case of XR, for example, those are generated directly from SysDB. Um, in other cases, they might be generated using the TLF Conf D technology. Um, but those then, you know, you have a model, which is great, but the model is inherently proprietary because it's being driven from something underneath in a sort of one-to-one -one mapping. 
So I think the, the medium term is how do we then get these standardized models out there? So Carl and I and a bunch of other people are working within Cisco agreeing what we think standardized models should be and then working through the ITF and as Christine mentioned with um, customers driving stuff, you know, really interesting to the open config effort where people like BT and Google are coming and saying this is what we want the models to look like. So, so I guess we're shooting towards that. Uh, long term, I think what I would like to see, and this is me speaking you know, entirely for myself, is I'd like to see boxes flip things upside down so that the base of the box is a Yang model data store, effectively a NetConf data store, and then things like CLI sit on top of that rather than the other way around. But that, that's a long term aspiration. You know, short term right now, what do we want to do? We want to get APIs out there so you can start using them. One of the things so we for, might want for, to add yeah. to that is what I, we're doing. Let me make a comment about APKM. Yeah. So uh, our short term strategy is much more basic than all the other ones because the use cases that we see for early adoption in the enterprise are very basic. They want to just do some basic troubleshooting, uh, maybe some dynamic QoS. Uh, but what we found was in the early days when we started beta the new product is that there is a, an inherent fear to write policies in an enterprise structure. Because again, you're geographically dispersed. You can't just have an engineer go cross country to fix a problem that a piece of software uh, caused as a QoS marking or an ACL change. And so what we did in February when we released the first controlled availability release of APKM, we actually ripped out the white policy uh, infrastructure. So the controller to use today is read only. And the read only is very low risk. We have a business model of giving it away, and it has a path visualization application on top of it that responds to a lot of the problems you guys have today when you get a ticket that somebody can't connect to a server or can't connect to a person, and you can find the path in a minute rather than spending hours or days trying to replicate that. So our strategy moving forward from that is to continue to build on that but slowly add in the right policy functions moving forward. And so the next release that's coming out soon will be tied, uh, tightly coupled to our IWAN strategy, where you will be able to do some prescriptive day zero writing. But it's sort of lightweight stuff to get you used to writing and trusting a controller. And then after that, the heavy lifting stuff will come uh, in a general availability release. And so we're taking an approach that really is not sort of technology driven as much as, as is adoption driven. Start with a read-only controller because it's very benign. Move when you're comfortable with having that controller there, discovering your network and sort of looking at it. Do a very small write um, you know, in, in the area of dynamic QoS, in the area of you know, maybe D, uh, some uh, QoS, dynamic QoS marking changes to make sure an IP video and voice call can connect. Again, it's not going to create your network if it doesn't work right, and then get into the heavy lifting, hey, we'll do uh, the self-healing, all configuration management stuff. But the strategy there is crawl, walk, run, and it's all based on uh, your pace uh, of adoption. One of the things I think we might want to introduce also is what we're doing with partners, because one of the key areas of having a software-driven strategy that allows us to bring partners into what we're doing. So it's not just what we're doing, it's what we're enabling our partners to do. Would you like to address that, Christine? Our partner adoption uh, strategy, uh, ISV adoption. Ah, uh, okay. So, um, so again, when we provide APIs, I mean, the idea is, is that it's not just us that's consuming the APIs through our controllers and orchestration systems, but it's really about the ecosystem of partners as well. So we're working with, for example, in the data center, um, you know, the DevOps tool chain vendors, such as we mentioned earlier, Puppet Chef, Ansible. Uh, and in the APKM space and the enterprise space, we're realizing that in really the, you know, the, the, um, the, the campus branch type of networks, really what people are finding is they need to be able to go ahead and provide really dynamic and um, uh, user-centric quality of service. So when people are using collaboration products, I think all of us use you know, IM messaging um, systems within our, our desktops today, or you know, IP-based uh, voice or video. And when we are deploying these kind of technologies in the enterprise, um, uh, use to the enterprise users, how could we make sure that uh, we provide good integration with other, collab you know, other um, collaboration technologies, Cisco technologies, as well as ecosystem technologies, and we're working with um, partners to enable those kind of um, uh, quality of service delivery uh, in terms of um, the user experience. Um, and so those are kind of examples of what we're doing in, in, um, in terms of the ISV-based um, 
ecosystem development and some of the areas that we've um, started working on. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one more question from the audience. Excellent. Yeah, well, Two more to squeeze it in. <laughs> This, this might be quick. How can we stay involved in the conversation, in this conversation after the conference? DevNet. Join DevNet. Uh, use the communities there to stay in contact. Uh, you can have access to the technology. You can engage with us in conversations. Uh, continue to come to training events. Use the Learning Lab. Use the Sandbox. It's all there at DevNet, developer.cisco.com. Sir? Gentlemen, sir, you had a question. Hi. Actually, we might want to get you guys some more of these, and everyone else could probably hear you guys better. But uh, <laughs> quick, quick question that I had was um, the gentleman over here asked some question, uh, question, and your response was, well, you know, let's turn the question back around on you guys, and you tell us what you're looking to do. So, um, and this might not be the, the form to ask this question, but say, say for example, you had a, a homogenized multi-vendor environment, um, and the way that you solve problems today, specifically regarding implementation, is a handful of expect scripts, a handful, you know, of Python scripts, and uh, and you say, hey, right. Uh, and I, and I figured that, that, that you would be the one ra raising your hand here, right? So the big challenge is, is that if you don't, we have Nexus environments, we have multi-vendor environments, how do you wrap all that stuff together and, you know, start automating that process? Mm -hmm. Soup to nuts, right? Yeah. Can I start? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. That's what I've been doing for the last five to 10 years, right? And we seriously, I mean, again, the reason for the acquisition from Cisco of Taylor, right? was that we took a long step away from expect style wrapping, right? And said, look, there just gotta be a declarative fashion that we can actually, instead of saying, look, here's, here are the steps to do this, you know how expect works, right? Instead saying, look, here is the synthesized or normalized, if you like, declarative data model way of explaining, again, the syntax, semantics, and the operations towards a data set. And it turns out that in a multi-vendor world, we have yet to find a vendor that we could not describe in a declarative fashion, right? So again, from the top level orchestration, that is the way we're looking at life. It's not, you know, if this, then that. It's rather, this is a tree of data that you can manipulate, and then there's protocols, right? So by making a big d difference between here's the data set and here's how you manipulate it, we actually take a, a step far beyond that. Now, look, with the other hand, what we're saying to the industry, coming all the way back to the almost like the, 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 the core of this conversation is that we think that for the infrastructure, that is the way to think about it, right? Have the assets explain themselves in a formalized modal fashion. Again, in order to snap ourselves out of the expect scripts and into the declarative world. What we're providing now is a stopgap, um, the, again, all the way back to Giles, right? is that there's a stopgap, there's horrible APIs out there, they're called CLIs, right? We have found a way to describe CLIs in a declarative fashion while we're working towards a world where CLIs is the, or it's a break fix API rather than an actual provisioning API. Mm -hmm. So I, I take a front when you say uh, <laughs> things like expect, we're way beyond that. We are now at a point where we can show you and we, we do show you yangified, if you like, or declarative descriptions of the CLI, right? But it's a stopgap because we don't think it's particularly beautiful, but we understand that that's what we need to do now in order to move forward. Well, well we could use that as a, as a method to basically get that to roll up into an orchestration platform, essentially then, right? Come talk to me. Okay. <laughs> that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We've reached the top of the hour, and there's clearly more to be discussed here. We do have the DevNet Zone here. And we have the SDN and DevOps pods. We have many more sessions throughout the rest of this week. And we have a conversation ongoing at developer.cisco.com. For now, we've got a three to stage because people are coming on next. So the panel, thank you very much.